Part One of King Edward the First of England. Three Essays. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by David Wales. King Edward the First of England. Three Essays by Thomas Frederick Tout. A Medieval Burglary. Part One, Section One. The burglary about which I have to speak tonight I did not discover by ransacking the picturesque and humorous annals of medieval crime. I came across the details of this incident when seeking for something quite different, for it happened when I was attempting to investigate the technicalities of the history of the administrative department known as the King's Wardrobe but so human a story did something to cheer up the weary paths of dry as dust and he hands it on to you in the hope that you will not find it absolutely wanting in instruction and amusement now my burglary was the burglary of the king's treasury or more precisely of the treasury of the king's wardrobe within the precincts of the abbey at westminster the date of the event was 24 April 1303. More precisely, according to the chief burglar's own account, it was on the evening of that day that the burglar effected an entrance into the king's treasury, from which, he tells us, he escaped with as much booty as he could carry on the morning of 26 April. Who had committed the burglary is a problem which was not quite settled even by the trials which followed the offence, though these trials resulted in the hanging of some half a dozen people at least. But after the hanging of the half dozen, it was still maintained in some quarters that the burglary was committed by one robber only, though charges of complicity in his guilt were in common fame extended to something like a hundred individuals, and in this case common fame was not, I think, at fault. I wish, first of all, to explain the meaning of the sentence, rather cryptic to the generality, in which I spoke of my burglary as that of the robbery of the treasury of the king's wardrobe within Westminster Abbey. For this purpose, I must ask you to carry your minds back to the Westminster of the early years of the 14th century. Westminster was then what Kensington was in the 18th or early 19th century, a court suburb aloof from the traffic and business of the great city of london now the twin centres of westminster were the king's palace and the adjacent benedictine abbey the rough plan which i am permitted to print on the opposite page will show the close relation of the two great groups of buildings it was much closer in many ways than the relations between the houses of parliament the modern representative of the old palace and the present abbey buildings if these latter largely remain despite many destructive alterations and details in their ancient site we must remember that there was nothing like the broad modern road that separates the east end of the abbey from westminster hall and the house of lords a wall enclosed the royal precincts and went westward to within a few feet of the monks infirmary and the end of st margaret's church the still existing access to the abbey on the east side of the south transept through the door by which you can still go into poet's corner having the chapter house on your left and henry the seventh's chapel on your right was the portal by which immediate access to the palace could be gained through a gate in this wall the space between the abbey and the palace wall was occupied by the churchyard of st margaret's the parish church or rather its successor still crouches beneath the shade of the neighbouring minster this churchyard covered the ground now taken up by henry the seventh's chapel which of course was not as yet in existence in the midst of this grassy plot stood the chapter house of the monks of westminster with its flying buttresses and its single pillar supporting its huge vault then newly erected by the pious zeal of henry the third 
Westminster Abbey was founded by Edward the Confessor, and substantially refounded by Henry the Third, who had shown immense care and lavished large sums on a grandiose scheme for the rebuilding of the great house of religion, which contains the shrine of his favorite saint, in whose honor he had given his son the name of Edward. The rebuilding went on into the reign of Edward I, who was not much inferior to his father in his zeal for the church, and was doubly bound to honor his father's wishes and the memory of his own patron saint. In the closing years of the thirteenth century, circumstances compelled Edward I to desist from this work. The king now found himself dragged into enormous expenses by the French, Scottish, and Flemish wars. He was perforce turned from church building to get men and money for his wars. The finances of England under Edward I were less elastic than under Mr. Lloyd George, and modern credit and banking were then in their very infancy. Edward I, though he imposed taxes which would make the most stalwart militarist of today quiver, soon found himself hopelessly in debt. To meet his burdens, the king constantly employed differentiated taxation, but the differentiation was calculated by rather a different method from that in fashion nowadays. It was a differentiation according to status, not according to wealth. The clergy, who were not expected to fight, were expected to pay more heavily than the layman. Let us take as an instance of how things were then done the taxes levied in 1294 when the fighting country districts were called upon to pay a tenth of their movables in taxation, and the wealthier and more peaceful towns were asked for a sixth. From the clergy a tax equal, I think, to a modern income tax of ten shillings in the pound was demanded, and it is said that when the dean of St. Paul's heard of this unprecedented impost, he fell dead on the spot. If such heroic efforts, I mean the king's, not the dean's, were necessary in 1294 at the beginning of England's troubles, how much worse things must have become by 1303, after ten years of storm and stress. By this date, Edward I's finances were indeed in a bad state. Historians are only now gradually beginning to realize how embarrassed the great king was in the last years of his reign, and how desperate were some of his attempts to fill his exchequer. The whole of Edward's declining years were not equally strenuous, though his finances steadily grew worse. Before the end of the old century, Edward had got over the worst of his troubles abroad. He therefore determined to devote himself, with characteristic energy, to the conquest of the rebel Scots. Since, therefore, Scotland now became the king's chief anxiety, Edward made his headquarters in the north of England. In those days, where the king lived, there the machinery of government was to be found. For though England in the 13th century had centralized institutions, those institutions were not centralized in a local capital. It is true that one English city was immensely more important than all the rest. London in the 13th as in the 18th century was relatively to other towns even greater and more important than is the case nowadays. Of course, Edward I's London to our eyes would be quite a little place, but at a time when there was, outside London, perhaps no town of more than 10,000 inhabitants, and very few of that population, a city four or five times that size was something portentous. Yet this greatness of London was due to its commercial activity, much more than to the fact that it was the capital of the country, or its seat of government. In reality, there was no capital in the modern sense, for the English tradition was that the government should follow the king. It was only very gradually that the governing machinery of the land was permanently settled in Westminster or London. There was, however, already a tendency towards making the great city, or rather its neighboring court suburb, a center of permanent administrative offices, a capital in the modern sense. Thus, the Court of Common Pleas had been settled in London since Magna Carta, 
and the exchequer that is the department of finance had also been fixed there since the reign of henry the second these were however still the exceptions which proved the rule the office of the chancery which was not then a law court but the secretarial office of state followed the king so also did certain branches of the administration which depended on the court and were intended first of all to be the machinery for the government of the king's household in the middle ages no distinction was made between the king and the kingdom if the king had devised a useful machine for governing his household and estates he naturally used it for any other purpose for which he thought it would be useful we find therefore the court offices of administration and finance working side by side with the national offices not only in dealing with household affairs but in the actual work of governing the country the most important of these household offices was that called the king's wardrobe originally the wardrobe was of course the closet in which the king hung up his clothes and the staff belonging to it were the valets and uh, servants whose business it was to look after them from this modest beginning the king's wardrobe had become an organized office of government its clerks rivaled the officers of the exchequer in their dealings with financial matters and the officers of the chancery in the number of letters mandates orders and a general administrative business which passed through their hands the wardrobe always followed the king in war time then it was far away from london at or near the scene of fighting in such periods it became the great spending department while the exchequer normally remained at westminster collecting the revenue of the country and forwarding the money to the wardrobe which spent it for five years before 1303, the king had thrown his chief energies into the conquest of Scotland. Under these circumstances, London and Westminster saw little of him. Moreover, he found it convenient to have near him in the north even the sedentary offices of government. Accordingly, in 1298, Edward transferred the exchequer, the law courts, and the chancery to York. From 1298, then, to 1303, york rather than westminster might have been called the capital of england and the king's appearances to the south were few and far between the occasion of such visits was generally his desire to get money and to make arrangements with his creditors from such a short sojourn the king went north in the early months of thirteen o three despite all his efforts it was only in that year that he was really able to put his main weight into the scottish war when our burglary took place king court and government offices had been removed to york for over five years under medieval conditions the eye of a vigilant taskmaster was an essential condition of efficiency it followed then that during edward's long absence things at westminster were allowed to drift into an extraordinary state of confusion and disorder affairs were made worse by the fact that even kings were not always free to choose their own servants thus the king's palace at westminster was in the hands of an hereditary keeper there was nothing strange about this in the middle ages such offices were frequently held by hereditary right just as in the east everybody takes up his father's business as a matter of religious duty earl curzon once pointed out to the electors of oldham that in india there are still hereditary tailors who did their work very well however this may be with tailors in the east and legislators in the west the hereditary keeper of edward's palace of westminster did not prove to be a very effective custodian of his master's property his name was john shench or senche and he held two hereditary offices that of keeper of the king's palace at westminster and also the keepership of the fleet prison in right of his wife joan who had inherited both from her father thus in addition to the keepership of the palace john shinchy kept the king's prison of the fleet in the city of london as a rule john and his wife joan had their habitation in the prison in the city 
john therefore employed as his deputy at westminster an underling a certain william of the palace who kept or rather did not keep for him the king's palace at westminster however early in the year thirteen o three john left his abode in the city where his wife remained and took up his quarters in the palace apparently the prison was not so comfortable a place for an easy-going officer to live in as the palace perhaps too the domestic restraints imposed upon shenshi in the city were burdensome to him certainly gay times now ensued in the deserted palace soon john and william in the absence of the higher authorities seemed to have gathered together a band of disreputable boon companions of both sexes whose drunken revels and scandalous misconduct were soon notorious throughout the neighbourhood one element in this band of revellers was i regret to say a certain section of the monks of the neighbouring monastery for as the absence of the king and the court had left the palace asleep as it were so also had the monastery at westminster sunk into a deeper and more scandalous slumber the enthusiasm effort and excitement which had marked the period of henry the third's reconstruction of westminster abbey had now died down medieval man though zealous and full of ideas was seldom persistent it is a commonplace of history that when the first impulse of fervor that attended a new order a new foundation had passed away religious activity was followed by a strong reaction the great period of the monastery at westminster had been during its reconstitution under henry the third but that time of energy had now worked itself out and the abbey had gone to sleep the work of reconstruction had stopped from lack of funds the royal favor as well as the royal presence was withdrawn gradually from the abbey moreover a few years earlier a disastrous fire devastated the monastic buildings and only just spared the chapter house and the abbey church it looks as if the monks had to camp out in half-ruined buildings till their home could be restored all this naturally relaxed the reins of discipline the more so since the abbot walter of winlock was an old man whose hold on the monks was slight and some of the chief officers of the abbey the obintitaris as they were called were singularly incompetent or unscrupulous persons it followed naturally that many of the fifty monks became slack beyond ordinary standards of medieval slackness it was both from obedientiaries and common monks that john shinchi and william of the palace secured the companions for their unseemly revels there now comes upon the scene a new figure in fact the hero of the burglary richard of pontecut richard of pontecut began life as a clerk but abandoned his clergy for the more profitable calling of a wandering trader in wool cheese and butter england's economic position in those days reminds us of the state of things now prevailing in argentina or australia rather than in modern industrial england she had little to sell abroad save raw materials especially wool which was largely exported to the great clothing towns of flanders this traffic took pudlicut to ghent and bruges in twelve ninety eight when edward i had allied with the flemings against the king of france but his trading adventures were as unsuccessful as the king's military efforts in flanders moreover after the king's return to england pudlicut had the ill luck to be among those merchants arrested as a surety for the debts which edward had left behind him in the low countries this unceremonious treatment of an alien ally is a method of medieval frightfulness which may be recommended to our alien enemies but edward's credit was so bad that we can hardly blame the flemings for leaving no stone unturned to obtain payment of their debts whether they succeeded i do not know before long richard escaped from his flemish jail leaving his property in flanders in the hands of his captors nursing a grievance against the king and with dire poverty facing him 
he took lodgings in london where like many bankrupts he seems to have generally had enough money to indulge in all the personal gratifications that he had a special mind to practise it seems that in the pursuit of his disreputable pleasures padlicat was brought into contact with john shenshi william of the palace and the other merrymakers lay and ecclesiastical in the lodge of the king's palace of westminster he had a specious excuse for haunting westminster hall he was uh, he says himself seeking a remedy in the king's courts for the property he had lost in flanders how he could find one when these courts were in york i cannot say but as we shall see many of Publicut's personal statements are difficult to reconcile with facts however edward himself soon came to westminster but withdrew after a short stay leaving Publicut unpaid we have seen how near was the palace to the abbey and how the palace keeper's monastic friends formed a living bridge between the two one result of these pleasant social relations was that the abbey of westminster soon became familiar ground to Pudlicut. one day when disturbed at the hopelessness of getting his grievances redressed by the king he wandered through the cloisters of the abbey and noticed with greedy eyes the rich stores of silver plate carried in and out of the refectory of the monks by the servants who were waiting on the brethren at meals the happy idea struck him to seek a means to enable him to come at the goods which he saw thus the king's foundation might somewhat irregularly be made to pay the king's debts Pudlicut soon laid his plans accordingly the very day after the king left westminster Pudlicut found a ladder reared up against a house near the palace gate he put this ladder against one of the windows of the chapter house he climbed up the ladder found a window that opened by means of a cord opened the window and swung himself by the same cord into the chapter house thence he made his way to the refectory and secured a rich booty of plate which he managed to carry off and sell Publicot's success with the monk's plate did not profit him for long within nine months and we may believe surely this part of his not too veracious tale the proceeds of the sale of the silver cups and dishes of the abbey had been eaten up no doubt the loose life he was living and the revels with the keepers of the palace involved a constant need for plentiful supplies of ready cash anyhow by the end of 1302 richard was again destitute and looking out for something more to steal it was doubtless dangerous to rob the monks any more and perhaps the intimacy which was now established between him and his monastic boon companions suggested to richard a more excellent way of restoring his fortunes his plan was now to rob the king's treasury and his success seemed assured since as he tells us he knew the premises of the abbey where the treasury was and how he might come to it how he profited by his knowledge we shall soon see but first we must for a moment part company with Publicut's confession which up to now i have followed with hesitation but for the next stage of our story it is plainly almost the contrary of the truth before we can with advantage explain why we can no longer trust his tale it would be well for us to state what this treasury was and how it could be got at let us begin with the word treasury in the fourteenth century treasury meant simply a storehouse or at its narrowest a storehouse of valuables to us the treasury is the government department of finance but under edward i the state office of finance was the exchequer which as we saw was located normally at westminster but since twelve ninety eight at york when at westminster the exchequer had a treasury or storehouse there also yet in its absence it is not likely that it kept either valuables or money at westminster but side by side with the state office was the household office of finance the wardrobe and though the wardrobe office was itinerating with the king it still kept a treasury or storehouse at westminster 
and this for the sake of greater safety had been placed for some years at least within the precincts of the abbey from the monastic point of view it was doubtless an inconvenience that nearness to the royal dwelling compelled them to offer their premises for the royal service accordingly kings not infrequently made demands upon the abbey to use its buildings thus the chapter house became a frequent place for meetings of parliament and at a later time it was used and continued to be used till the nineteenth century for the storage of official records in the same way edward secured the crypt underneath the chapter house as one of the storehouses of his wardrobe when the crypt was first used for this purpose i do not know but records show us that it was already in use in twelve ninety one at which date it was newly paved it was not the only storehouse of the wardrobe there was another treasury of the wardrobe in the tower of london but this was mainly used for bulky articles arms and armour cloth furs furniture and the like most of what we should call treasure was deposited in the westminster crypt and we are fortunate in having still extant a list of the jewels preserved there in twelve ninety eight the time when the court began to establish itself for its five years of sojourn in the north in thirteen o three jewels and plate were still the chief treasures preserved there some money was there also notably a store of gold florins of florence the only gold coins currently used in england at a time when the national mints limited themselves to the coinage of silver but i do not think there could have been much money for edward's needs were too pressing his financial policy too much from hand to mouth for the crypt at westminster to be a hoard of coined money like the famous prussian kriegsgeschätz at spandau which we now rejoice to learn is becoming rapidly depleted whatever its contents edward estimated that their value was a hundred thousand pounds a sum equivalent to a year's revenue of the english state in ordinary times unluckily medieval statistics are largely mere guesswork but the amount of the guess at least suggests the feeling that the value of the treasure stored in the crypt was very considerable the crypt under the chapter house is one of the most interesting portions of the abbey buildings at westminster it is little known because it is not i think generally shown to visitors i am indebted to the kindness of my friend bishop ryle the present dean for an opportunity of making a special inspection of it it is delightfully complete and delightfully unrestored the chief new thing about it seems the pavement but the dean's well-informed verger told me that it was within living memory that this pavement had replaced the flooring of twelve ninety one numerous windows give a fair amount of light to the apartment though the enormous thickness of the walls some thirteen feet it was said prevent the light being very abundant even on a bright day the central column the lower part of the great pillar from which radiates the high soaring vaults of the chapter house above alone breaks the present emptiness of the crypt considerable portions of the column are cut away to form a series of neatly made recesses and there are recesses within these recesses which suggest in themselves careful devices for secreting valuables for it would be easy to conceal them by the simple expedient of inserting a stone here and there where the masonry had been cut away and so suggesting to the unwary an unbroken column i should not like to say that these curious store places already existed in thirteen o three but there is no reason why they should not certainly they fit in admirably with the use of the crypt as a treasury one other point we must also remember about the dispositions of this crypt there is only one access to it and that is neither from the chapter house above nor from the adjacent cloister but from the church itself a low vaulted passage is entered by a door at the southeast corner of the south transept of the abbey now for many centuries the special burial place for poets eminent and otherwise 
this passage descends by a flight of steep steps to the crypt itself and the flight originally seems i am told doubtless as another precaution against robbery to have been a broken one suggesting that a steep drop presumably spanned by a short ladder further barred access to the crypt we must remember too that this sole access to the treasury was within a few feet of the sacristy of the abbey the sacristy was the chapel to the south of the south transept and communicating with it where the sacrist kept the precious vessels appropriated to the service of the altar altogether it looks as if the crypt were originally intended as a storehouse for such church treasure as the sacrist did not need for his immediate purposes from this use it was diverted as we have seen to the keeping of the royal treasures nowadays the sacristy is called the chapel of st faith and is used for purposes of private devotion we must not forget the close connection in our period of the sacristy and the crypt the connection becomes significant when we remember that among pudlicut's monastic boon companions at the palace keeper's lodge was the sacrist of the abbey adam of warfield End of Part 1, Section 1part one of king edward the first of england three essays by thomas frederick tout this librivox recording is in the public domain part one section two of a medieval burglary pudlicut had made up his mind to steal the king's treasure the practical problem was how to get access to it if we examine the evidence collected at the inquiry we find that there are two discrepant accounts as to how the robber effected his purpose the one is warranted by the testimony of a large number of sworn juries of reputable citizens of every ward in the city of london of burgesses of westminster and of the good men of every hundred in the adjacent shires of middlesex and surrey it is like much truthful evidence rather vague but its general tendency is while recognizing that pudlicut is the prime offender to make various monks and palace officers his accomplices of the latter category william of the palace seems to have been the most active while of the many monks adam warfield the sacrist was the most generally denounced but the proved share of both adam and william was based largely on the discovery of stolen property in their possession the evidence of the jury suggests theories as to how the crime may have been perpetrated it does not make the methods of the culprits clear and palpable but it suggests that masons and carpenters were called in so that some breaking in of the structure was attempted and in particular it suggests that the churchyard was the thoroughfare through which the robbers removed their booty let us turn next to Podlicut's own confession that remarkable document from which i have already borrowed many details though seldom without a word of warning according to his confession publicot having resolved to rob the treasury came to the conclusion that the best way to tackle the business was to pierce a hole through the wall of thirteen feet of stone that supported the lower story of the chapter house for so colossal a task time was clearly needed richard accordingly devoted himself during the dark nights of winter and early spring to drilling through the solid masonry he attacked the building from the churchyard or eastern side having access thereto from the palace but the churchyard was open to the parish and the thrifty churchwardens of st margaret's had led to a neighbouring butcher the right of grazing his sheep in it now the butcher was told that his privilege was withdrawn and passers-by were sent round by another path this was a precaution against the casual wayfarer seeing the hole which was daily growing larger to hide from the casual observer the great gash in the stonework richard tells us that he sowed hemp seed in the churchyard near the hole and that this grew so rapidly that the tender hemp plants not only hid the gap in the wall but provided cover for him to hide the spoils he hoped to steal from the treasury when the hole was complete on twenty four april 
Puglacat went through and found to his delight that the chamber was full of baskets, chests, and other vessels for holding valuables, plate, relics, jewels, and gold florins of Florence. Richard remained in the crypt, gloating over the treasure surrounding him from the evening of 24 April to the morning of 26 April. Perhaps he found it impossible to tear himself away from so much wealth, or perhaps the intervening day, being the Feast of St. Mark, there were too many people about, and too many services in the abbey, to make his retreat secure. However, he managed on the morning of 26 April to get away, taking with him as much as he could carry. He seems to have dropped, or to have left lying about, a good deal that he was unable to carry, possibly for his friends to pick up such is public hut's story it is the tale of a bold ruffian who glories in his crime and is proud to declare i alone did it but there was a touch of heroism and of devotion in our hero thus taking on himself the whole blame he voluntarily made himself the scapegoat of an offence for which scores were charged and in particular he took on his own shoulders the heavy share of responsibility which belonged to the negligent monks of westminster now as to the credibility of public hut story we must admit that some of the juries accepted evidence that corroborated some parts of it sworn men declared their belief that the crypt was approached from the outside that masons and carpenters were employed on the business that the churchyard was closely guarded and access refused even to the butcher who rented the grazing it is clear too that the booty was got rid of through the churchyard and that piecemeal there is evidence even that hemp was sown though the verdict of a jury cannot alter the conditions of vegetable growth in an english winter we must allow too that it is pretty certain that warfield had not the custody of the keys of the crypt though he was doubtless able to give facilities for tampering with the door or forcing the lock yet public hot's general story remains absolutely incredible it was surely impossible to break through the solid wall and no incuriousness or corruption would account for wall-piercing operations being unnoticed when carried on in the midst of a considerable population for three months on end some of publica's lies were inconceivable in their crudity is it likely that hemp sown at christmas time would before the end of april afford sufficient green cover to hide the hole in the wall and to secret gleaming articles of silver within its thick recesses and how are we to believe that there was a great gaping hole in the wall of the crypt when nothing was heard of the crime for several weeks after its perpetration and no details of the king's losses were known until two months after the burglary when the keeper of the wardrobe unlocked the door of the treasury and examined its contents a more artistic liar would have made his confession more convincing what really happened seems to me to have been something like this i have no doubt the public hut got into the treasury by the simple process of his friend adam of warfield giving him facilities for forcing the door or perhaps breaking a window he remained in the crypt a long time so that he might hand out its contents to confederates who as we learn from the depositions ate drank and revelled till midnight for two nights running in a house within the precincts of the fleet prison and then went armed and horsed to westminster returning towards daybreak loaded with booty but not only the revellers in chinchi's headquarters but many monks many abbey servants the custodians of the palace the leading goldsmiths of the city and half the neighbours must have been cognizant of if not participating in the crime it speaks well for honour among thieves that it was not until deplorable indiscretions were made in the disposal of the booty that any news of the misdeed reached the ears of any of the official custodians of the treasure suspicion of the crime was first excited by the discovery of fragments of the spoil in all sorts of unexpected places a fisherman applying his craft in the then silver thames netted a silver goblet which had evidently been the property of the king 
Passers-by found cups, dishes, and similar precious things hidden behind tombstones and other rough hiding places in St. Margaret's churchyard. Boys playing in the neighboring fields found pieces of plate concealed under hedgerows. Such discoveries were made as far from Westminster as Kentish Town. Moreover, many other people lighted upon similar pieces of treasure trove, Foreign money found its way into the hands of the money changers at London, York, and Lyme, and other remote parts. The city goldsmiths were the happy receivers of large amounts of silver plate, among them, I regret to say, being William Torrell, the artist goldsmith, whose skill in metalwork has left such an abiding mark in the decorations of the Abbey Church. There were two scandalous stories whispered abroad one of them was that a woman of loose life explained her possession of a precious ring by relating that it was given her by dom adam the sacrist so that she should become his friend such tales soon made the story of the robbery common property at last it came to the ears of the king and his ministers then encamped at linlithgow for the scottish war Thereupon, on 6 June, the king appointed a special commission of judges to investigate the matter. On 20 June, John Droxford, the keeper of the wardrobe, came to Westminster with the keys of the crypt, and then and only then did any official examination of the treasury take place. An entry was made into the crypt, and the damage which had been done was inspected. The result is still to be read in an inventory of the treasures lost and the treasures found, which Droxford drew up, and which may now be studied in print. It is pleasant to say that by the time Droxford went to work, much of the treasure, which had been scattered broadcast, was being brought back, and that more was soon to follow. The first investigations as to where the treasure had been carried led to fruitful results a good deal of it was found hidden beneath the beds of the keeper of the palace and of his assistant still more was found in the lodgings of richard pudlicott and his mistress adam the sacrist and some of his brother monks and their servants were discovered to be in possession of other missing articles altogether when droxford had finished his inventory a large proportion of the articles which had been lost were reclaimed ultimately it seems that the losses were not very severe wholesale arrests were now made richard pudlicott was apprehended on twenty five june and william of the palace soon experienced the same fate before long the connection which the monks had had with the business seems so well established that the whole convent including the abbot and forty-eight monks were indicted and sent to the tower where they were soon joined by thirty-two other persons this time the king's net had spread rather too widely and the indiscriminate arrest of guilty and innocent excited some measure of sympathy even for the guilty the majority of the clerical prisoners were released on bail but some half-dozen laymen and ten monks were still kept in custody both the released and the imprisoned culprits raised a great outcry sending petitions to the king demanding a further inquiry into the whole matter the first commission meanwhile had been impaneling juries and collecting evidence but the matter was so serious that in november a second royal commission was appointed to hear and determine the matter the members of this second commission were chosen from among the most eminent of the king's judges including the chief justice of the king's bench sir roger brabazon and the shrewdest judge of the time william beerford afterwards chief justice of common pleas i have already indicated in outline the result of the investigations of the two judicial commissions i have told you how juries were impaneled from every hundred in the counties of middlesex and surrey and from the wards of the city of london and from westminster the details of the evidence are worthy of more special treatment than i can give them here because they afford a wonderful picture of the loose living easy-going slack negligent casual and criminal doings of medieval men and women i must however be content to restate the general result of the trials richard of pudlicott was found guilty 
various other people including william of the palace and certain monks were declared accomplices while adam warfield was shrewdly suspected to be at the bottom of the whole business more than a year was spent in investigations and it was not until march thirteen o four eleven months after the burglary that william of the palace and five other lay culprits were comfortably hanged the great problem was how to deal with the clerical offenders without adding to the king's difficulties by rousing the sleeping dogs of the church always ready to bark when the state meditated any infringement of the claim of all clerks to be subject solely to the ecclesiastical tribunals accordingly richard of publicut and ten monks were reserved for further treatment publicut as we have seen had been a tonsured person in his youth and he probably claimed as did the monks benefit of clergy it was probably now that publicot nobly tried to shield his monastic allies by his extraordinary confession his heroism however availed him nothing but whatever his zeal for the church edward i was upon adequate occasion ready to ride roughshod over clerical privileges and he always bitterly resented any attempt of a culprit who had lived as a layman trying to shield himself on the pretext that he had been a clerk in his youth his corrupt chief justice thomas wayland had sought to evade condemnation by resuming the tonsure and clerical garb which he had worn before he abandoned his orders to become a knight a country squire and the founder of a family of landed gentry but wayland's subdiaconate did not save him from exile and loss of land and goods pudlicut's sometime clerical character had even less power to preserve him he also paid tardily the capital penalty for his misdeed but it was surely his clergy that kept him alive in prison for more than two years after the date of the commission of his crime the fate of the incriminated clerks still hung in the balance when in the spring of thirteen o five edward came back in triumph to london rejoicing that at last he had effected the thorough conquest of scotland his cheerful frame of mind made him listen readily to the demands of the monks of westminster to have pity on their unfortunate brethren and to comply with the more general clerical desire that ecclesiastical privilege should be respected only a few months after the burglary the news of the outrage on pope boniface the eighth at anagni had filled all christendom with horror at the instance of philip the fair king of france and his agents in italy the pope was seized maltreated and insulted in the indignant words of dante christ was again crucified in the person of his vicar the universal feeling of resentment against so wanton a violation of ecclesiastical privilege was ingeniously used in favour of the monks of westminster among the monks arrested at first but soon released with the majority of their brethren were two men who had some reputation as historians one of these was magnanimous enough to write two or three years afterwards a sort of a funeral eulogy of edward but the other robert of reading who in my opinion kept the official chronicle of the abbey from thirteen o two to thirteen twenty six set forth the westminster point of view very effectively in the well-known version of the chronicle called flores historiarium the original manuscript of which is now in the chetham library in this is given what may be regarded as the official account of richard's burglary the robbery of the king of england was a crime only comparable to the robbery of the treasurer of boniface the eighth six months later at anagni the chronicler is most indignant at the suggestion that the monks had anything to do with the matter and laments passionately their long imprisonment and their unmerited sufferings he relies in substance on the story as told in publicut's confession the burglary was effected by a single robber so lacking in humour was the westminster analyst that he did not scruple to borrow the phraseology and the copious scriptural citations of a certain passion of the monks of westminster according to john the whole text of which is unfortunately not extant 
i may say however that the species of composition called a passion was particularly in vogue at the turn of the thirteenth and fourteenth centuries and is mainly characterized by its extraordinary skill in parodying the words of the scripture in order to describe in mock heroic vein some incident of more or less undeserved suffering for profanity grim humor and misapplied knowledge of the vulgate the passions of this period have no equal they are a curious illustration of the profane humor of the medieval ecclesiastic in his lighter moments the westminster analyst did not stand alone other monastic chroniclers took up and accepted his story it became the accepted monastic doctrine that one robber only had stolen the king's treasure and that therefore the monks of westminster were unwarrantably accused one writer added to his text a crude illustration of how it was imagined public had effected his purpose you may see opposite this page his rude pictorial representation of the one robber kneeling on the grass in the churchyard and picking up by a hand and arm extended through the broken window the precious stores within. But Publica's arm must have been longer than the arm of justice to effect this operation, and must have been twice or thrice the length of a tall man this same chronicler was not contented with repeating the parallel now recognized between the sufferings of the monks of westminster under their unjust accusations and the passion of pope boniface five months later at the hands of the robbers hired by the ruthless king of france he must give a picture of the anagni outrage as well as of the orthodox version of the westminster burglary how far he has succeeded you may gather from the rude sketch figured on the opposite page not only does he give us so vivid a picture of pope boniface's sufferings from the rude soldiery that the drawing might well be used as a representation of a martyrdom like that of st thomas of canterbury his sketch of three other sacrilegious warriors rifling the huge chest that contained the papal treasures skillfully suggests that robbery was the common motive that united the outrage at anagni to the outrage at westminster he leaves us to draw the deeper moral that the sinful desire of unhallowed laymen to bring holy church and her ministers into discredit was the ultimate root of both these scandals edward was satisfied with his scottish campaign he was becoming old and tired he was pleased to know that a great deal of the lost treasure had been recovered and he was always anxious to avoid scandal and to minimize any disagreement with the monks of his father's foundation he therefore condoned what he could not remedy he soon released all the monks from prison he even restored shenchi to his hereditary office of the keepership of the palace richard of publicut alone was offered up to vengeance in october thirteen o five richard was hanged regardless of his clergy affairs at the monastery of westminster were not improved after these events there was much quarrelling among the monks walter of winlock died there were disputes as to his succession an unsatisfactory appointment was made and there was a considerable amount of strife for a generation the feeling against the king was shown equally against his son and is reflected in the bitter westminster chronicle of the reign of edward the second one result of the demonstration of the futility of storing valuables within the precincts of the abbey was that the chief treasury of the wardrobe was bodily transferred to the tower of london some obvious morals might be drawn from this slight but not unpicturesque story but i will forbear from printing them one generalization i will however venture to make by way of conclusion the strongest impression left by the records of the trial is one of the slackness and the easy-going ways of the medieval man the middle ages do not often receive fair treatment some are perhaps too apt to idealize them as an age of heroic piety with its statesmen saints heroes artists and thinkers but such people are in all ages the brilliant exceptions 
the age of st francis of assisi of a dante of edward i of st louis of france of st thomas aquinas the age in which the greatest buildings of the world were made was a great time and had its great men but the middle ages were a period of strange contrasts shining virtues and gross vices stood side by side the contrasts between the clearly cut black and white of the thirteenth century are attractive to us immersed in the continuous gray of our own times but we find our best analogies to medieval conditions in those which are nowadays stigmatized as oriental conspicuous among them was a deep pervading shiftlessness and casualness medieval man was never up to time he seldom kept his promise not through malice but because he never did to-day what could be put off till to-morrow or the next day publica then is a typical medieval criminal he was doubtless a scamp but most of the people with whom he had dealings were loose-thinking easy-going folk like himself of course there are always the exceptions but ever the first with his gift of persistence was a peculiarly exceptional type in the middle ages and even edward i found it convenient to let things slide in small matters thus on this occasion edward began his investigation with great show of care and determination to sift the whole matter but when he found that thorny problems were being stirred up he determined not for the first time to let sleeping dogs lie and avoid further scandal we must not however build up too large a superstructure of theory on this petty story of the police courts plus a mild ecclesiastical scandal nor must we emphasize too much or generalize too largely from the signs of slackness and negligence shown in medieval trials i become more and more averse to facile generalization about the middle ages or medieval man they may moreover be made in both directions on the one side we have the doctrine of our greatest of recent scholars bishop stubbs that the thirteenth century was the greatest century of the middle ages the flowering type of medieval christianity and so on but on the other hand there is the contradictory generalization of students like my friend mr colton who surveys the time from st francis to dante with the conviction that the so-called great days of faith were the days of unrestrained criminality and violence both these views can be argued but neither are really convincing they seem to me to be obtained by looking at one side of the question only a more fruitful doctrine is surely the view that ordinary medieval men were not so very unlike ourselves and that their virtues and vices were not those of saints or ruffians but were not wholly out of relation to the ordinary humdrum virtues and vices that are found to-day End of Part 1, Section 2 of A Medieval Burglary by Thomas Frederick Tout. Part 2 of King Edward I of England, Three Essays by Thomas Frederick Tout. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part 2 The Conquest and Settlement of the Principality of Wales. 1274 to 1301 the first serious difficulty that met king edward in britain was presented by the attitude of the prince of wales Cowellan ap griffith had never cordially accepted the settlement of 1267 flushed with the greatness of his triumph he regarded the treaty of shrewsbury as but the starting point for a fresh career of aggression he never understood that the dexterous game which he had played so well when england was divided was the merest foolishness when the discord of king and barons was over and when a strong king ruling with the nation's good will stood in the place of the weak and irresolute henry Llewellyn was a man of vigorous character high courage and great dexterity and adroitness but there was something of the barbarian about him and he was slow to recognize new forces and tune his policy to altered conditions 
he never realized that the baron's wars were over and ever sought to pose with the english as the true successor of earl simon hoping to thus win the hand of eleanor montfort's only daughter and to renew with the sons the close connection that had existed between him and the great earl but edward i was not henry the third and the murderers of viterbo were but poor substitutes for earl simon the righteous moreover Llewellyn was not content with the part which he had hitherto occupied as leader of the welsh race inspired by the vain prophecies that credulity attributed to the wizard merlin and puffed up by the panegyrics of the bards and minstrels who revelled in his bounty Llewellyn dreamed of a time when the Saxons should be expelled from the island of Britain, and the ancient British race again rule over its old inheritance. He chafed, therefore, against the ties of vassalage that bound him to the English crown, and profiting by the absence of Edward in the first two years of his reign, he resisted all the efforts of the regents to extract from him the customary homage to the new king nor did the return of edward in twelve seventy four mend matters Llewellyn still excused himself shuffled and at last openly defied the royal mandates the rough rule of edward's ministers the chronic disputes of the welsh with a swarm of hostile marchers gave Llewellyn plenty of pretext and in the eyes of his subjects at least some sort of justification for his contemptuous disregard of feudal law edward was at last moved to profound anger we have seen how he rigorously fulfilled the most irksome of his obligations as duke of gascony he had no patience with the shifty welshman and sternly resolved to enforce his obligations by the sword the montforts established some connection with their old partisans in england but edward wisely checkmated their action by issuing a full pardon to the disinherited the best of the baronial party were now on his side thomas of cantaloupe earl simon's chancellor was bishop of hereford and actively cooperating with edward against Llewellyn nevertheless amory de montfort the most respectable of the sons of simon took ship with his sister eleanor to wales that she might become the bride of Llewellyn. but some bristol mariners captured the little squadron at sea edward put amory into prison and retained eleanor in the queen's household he paid no heed to Llewellyn's urgent appeals for their release he was resolved that the montforts should have no chance of reviving a party of popular opposition in twelve seventy six there was war all along the welsh border in the early summer of twelve seventy seven the feudal levies mustered at chester under the faithful earl of lincoln edward himself led the great expedition against Llewellyn his early experience taught him the right method of warfare and how best to win for himself allies among the welsh david the brother of Llewellyn, fought under edward's banner along with the many welsh chieftains who were jealous of Llewellyn's greatness broad roads were cut through the dense forests that then made dangerous the passage of the army from chester to the conway a considerable fleet mostly gathered from the sank ports sailed along the coast and kept the land forces well supplied with provisions and information Llewellyn made scarcely a show of resistance but retreated with all his men into the recesses of the great group of mountains which were in those days roughly known by the name of snowdon edward's plan was now to blockade his enemies in snowdon every exit from the mountains was closed while the fleet cut off all communications with anglesey whence alone Llewellyn could draw the supplies of corn necessary to keep his troops alive in the desolate regions of his retreat Llewellyn held out a long time but on the approach of winter he was starved into submission early in november he came down from the hills and accepted with what grace he could the hard terms imposed by edward in the treaty of conway 
by this convention the welsh prince resigned all claims over the four cantreds of perveda weled and consented to hold anglesey for his life only he retained his other lands along with the title of prince but they were burdened with fines and a yearly rent for anglesey and he was forced to deliver up hostages for his good behavior edward was however in no mood to exact these humiliating terms to the letter he remitted at once the rent and the fine and sent back the hostages Llewellyn now made his personal submission to edward at rudlin and afterwards attended the christmas court of his lord at westminster where he solemnly performed his long delayed homage before the assembled magnates the welsh prince was now in high favour next year he held another interview with edward at worcester where in return for further submission he was allowed to marry eleanor montfort edward himself attended the wedding ceremony Llewellyn's brother david had received his reward in a rich estate in the vale of cluid the treaty of conway gave edward an opportunity of renewing the plans of his early youth and introducing the english shire system and laws into the seated districts the county court of Carmarthen and cardigan which had continued a sickly and precarious existence since its first establishment was now revived while the justice of chester sought to subject the four cantreds to the jurisdiction of the cheshire shiremoot meanwhile english traders and settlers came in the train of the english armies and the castles that had first been established in the old days of norman aggressions were now rebuilt and strengthened to keep down the subject lands this policy excited the welsh inhabitants of the ceded districts to the utmost fury they complained that edward had shamefully broken the promise that he had made of ruling his new possessions according to their ancient customs and liberties edward answered that he would maintain the old welsh laws so far as they were good ones but that many of them were barbarous and directly at variance with the ten commandments such evil customs he could never observe as he was bound by his coronation oath to uphold justice this attitude was eminently characteristic edward's orderly and well-trained mind was disgusted at the barbarism of the old welsh laws and he honestly believed that he was doing his welsh subjects the best service in his power in uprooting that venerable but primitive jurisprudence that allowed the murderer to atone for his crime by a money payment and regarded wrecking as an unalienable right of the dwellers by the seashore but edward never understood the feelings of the welsh at thus seeing their most cherished institutions trampled scornfully under the foot of an alien conqueror his strong but somewhat narrow nature had few points of contact with the fiery hot-headed enthusiasts with whom he had now to deal he wished honestly enough that those welsh customs should remain which were not against his conception of natural justice but neither he nor his lawyers would put themselves in a sufficiently receptive attitude to understand them at bottom edward's real policy was to make welshmen englishmen as soon as possible and he was surprised that they resented his transparent sophisms and murmured at reforms that he had only meant for their good but now as ever edward was badly served by his subordinates the violence and brutality of his bailiffs and constables stood in damning contrast to his abstract talk about justice his best friends among the welsh fully shared in the national resentment to his policy david himself was deeply hurt and had quietly reconciled himself with his brother in the spring of twelve eighty two the long smouldering hostility of the four cantreds to the english system burst out into open revolt on the eve of palm sunday david fell upon rudlin castle and took prisoner roger clifford edward's justiciar Llewellyn hurried over the conway to his assistance and devastated the country to the very gates of chester 
a simultaneous rising broke out in the south where the welsh insurgents took possession of the new castle of abertswith the key of cardigan and carmarthen edward was deeply enraged at the news of the new rebellion he now resolved to make a great effort to finally crush the power of the welsh prince archbishop peckham of canterbury put cluallan under the ban of the church great armies were poured into both the northern and southern districts of the principality the strategy of twelve seventy seven was renewed cluallan was again shut up in snowdon whither the archbishop journeyed on a vain effort to induce him to submit but edward would accept no terms but unconditional surrender though he gave a private assurance that coellan should receive an estate of a thousand pounds a year in england with due provision for his brother but Cluellen scorned such a degrading submission and mindful of his fate in twelve seventy seven escaped almost unattended from snowdon before the winter snows again compelled him to surrender he soon appeared in the marches of the upper wye hoping to raise a fresh revolt among the welsh tenants of the mortimers on eleventh december Cluellen was slain in an obscure skirmish near Bulith. david who now called himself prince of wales managed to hold out until the next summer when his hiding-place amongst the bogs of snowdon was discovered by the treachery of some of his own countrymen with his capture the triumph of edward was completed a special parliament was summoned to shrewsbury to deal with the double-dyed traitor on third october twelve eighty three david was hung drawn and quartered with the approval of the assembled estates the principality was now conquered edward resolved that its future government should be put upon a solid basis he remained in wales almost continually until the work was done living for the most part at rudland and not finally quitting the country until the end of twelve eighty four in the spring of twelve eighty four he published at rudland the statute of wales which contained the chief points of the new scheme by it the principality was declared annexed to the crown and was constituted shire ground the already existing shires of cardigan and carmarthen were set up in a more legal and complete manner though much smaller in size than the modern counties they included the whole of the southern possessions of Cluellen. they were put under a justice of west wales who held his court at carmarthen in the same way the northern dominions of Cluellen were divided into the three counties of anglesey carnarvon and Merineth the three old shires of gwynedd they were ruled over by the justice of snowdon who kept his state at carnarvon sheriffs county courts coroners and bailiffs were set up as in england and a rough copy of english local government was thus introduced throughout the whole principality edward's welsh counties as a modern writer has well said bear to the english counties of this time some such relation as the territory of the united states bears to the fully organized state but it is to edward's credit that he set up what form of local government he thought best in his new possession and if at first the king's bailiffs and ministers had more power than in england the administration of the welsh shires fell almost from the first into native welsh hands and edward made the new divisions more acceptable by building them up out of the cantreds and comots which constituted the immemorial territorial divisions of the Cymry a sixth welsh county was also established by edward in flintshire but this small region was for most purposes annexed to edward's palatinate of cheshire and flintshire was for all practical purposes a mere dependency of the neighbouring earldom rather than an independent and autonomous shire with the shire system came in a good many english laws though edward made wise by experience now took good care to uphold such welsh customs as did not conflict with his sense of justice but beyond these limits edward's reforms did not go 
his welsh legislation left the lords marcher in the enjoyment of their disorderly feudal freedom though the annexation of the principality to the crown largely diminished their political importance the marchers had helped edward against Llewellyn, and he saw no good reason to disturb their vested rights and probably feared to provoke the hostility of the many great english barons who would have certainly resented any infringement of their jurisdiction in their welsh lordships on the contrary edward erected new lordships marcher in those parts of the four cantreds which were not included in the new shire of flint the most important of these was the lordship of denby which edward bestowed on his faithful follower the earl of lincoln the result of all this was that the separation of wales into principality and marches continued just as before until the reign of henry the eighth it speaks well for the wisdom of edward's legislation that it was as much from the marches as from the principality that edward's subsequent welsh troubles arose the subjection of the principality was completed by the establishment of a strong line of castles and fortified towns edward now repeated in the principality the policy already tried so successfully in gascony a row of bastides or ville anglaise were set up on the menai and the conway as on the garonne and the dordogne to serve the same purposes of protection and defence and to further in the same way the spread of commerce and civilization archbishop peckham advised edward to make the welsh live in towns and to send their children to school in england for thus only he declared would the welsh learn civility but edward's object was not so much to attract the welsh to live in his towns as to settle in them little bands of english soldiers officials and traders who would prove as in ireland the rallying points of an english interest though luckily for both england and wales the townsfolk soon intermingled with the dwellers in the country yet the history of welsh towns is practically the history of english influence in wales and down to the days of queen elizabeth the separation so far remained that english and not welsh was the ordinary spoken tongue of every market town in wales but even more than the welsh towns the welsh castles remain to this day a monument of edward's power the castle and walls of conway where fortress and town alike owed their existence to the conquest the carnarvon castle dominating the straits of menai and the rocky stronghold of harlech raised far above the waters of cardigan bay are the best memorials of edward's work in wales it has even been suggested that the well-known type of concentric castle to which these buildings belong was first brought into the west by edward and based upon his observations in syria of the mighty strongholds of the latin christians of palestine but edward cannot claim this credit and his boldest castles in wales were but copies of the already existing castle of carefully built a few years earlier by earl gilbert of gloucester yet if edward imitated the marchers in building castles the marchers imitated edward in setting up or granting charters to towns so that the castle building and town foundations extended over principality and marches alike the result was a great spread of civilization and wales after twelve eighty four though far from settled even according to the low standards of the middle ages attained a far greater measure of peace and prosperity after that the just though unsympathetic rule of edward had succeeded the unending factions and the bloody wars of the native princes of gwynedd archbishop peckham busied himself with the ecclesiastical reformation of wales like edward he showed scanty respect for welsh susceptibilities but he did good work in rebuilding churches raising the standard of church discipline removing the married priests and improving the education of the clergy
moreover he exhorted edward to maintain fully the ancient liberties of the welsh church and bitterly complained of the rash violence of edward's officials who destroy and overturn every ecclesiastical usage that differs from the anglican use to the no small peril of their souls his highest desire was to see the welsh better educated and accustomed to work for their living in august twelve eighty four edward celebrated his conquest by holding a round table tournament at nevin in carnarvonshire where the most famous knights of england and the continent fought amidst the wilds of snowdon wonderful relics were opportunely discovered including the body of constantine the great and the crown of king arthur the latter was presented to edward thus the glory of wales says the chronicler was transferred to the english edward had no great difficulty with his new subjects during the rest of his reign there were several revolts which threatened to become formidable but the only one which really taxed his resources was that which madog op Cuellen and his associates raised in twelve ninety four and this owes its importance to edward's other embarrassments at the time during edward's long sojourn in wales two of his children were born one of these edward soon became by his brother alfonso's death his father's heir his welsh birth had already endeared him to edward's new subjects and he had a welsh nurse and welsh attendants to keep up his interest in the land of his birth the stories that edward presented him on his birth to the welsh as their future prince have no more authority than the local tradition which points out as his birthplace a room in carnarvon castle which is manifestly of later date at last in thirteen o one edward created edward prince of wales thus keeping the principality separate from the crown though retaining it in the hands of the royal family and using it as in his own father's time as a means of training the heir in the work of government it was a wise measure edward of carnarvon was always a great favourite with the welsh who succoured him in his severest troubles and celebrated his mournful fate in dirges written in their native tongue edward the first's whole welsh policy brings out clearly his characteristic strength and weakness but despite his narrowness and want of sympathy his stern love of justice and equal laws made his policy in the long run a success especially against a power whose open resistance he could crush with an overwhelming strength he is generally described as the conqueror of wales more accurately he was the conqueror of the principality yet he never sought to annex the principality to england although he incorporated it with the english crown the principality like the palatine county of chester or the still abiding liberties of the lord's marcher was still a land standing by itself save on two occasions under edward the second no members of parliament were summoned to represent the principality at the king's court the king's writ and the king's english judges had no jurisdiction and the whole machinery of administration remained separate and distinct it was reserved for henry the eighth to make england and wales a single political unity End of part two Part three of King Edward the First of England Three Essays by Frederick Tout. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part three The End of the Reign thirteen oh five to thirteen oh seven. With Scotland subdued and apparently appeased, Edward was again able to turn his mind to English affairs. He was a man slow to forgive and tenacious in his policy he had neither forgotten nor forgiven the humiliations inflicted upon him by the union of the baronial and clerical opposition in the years between twelve ninety seven and thirteen o one 
he still chafed at the restraints then imposed upon his prerogative and his pious fear of breaking the oath he had so unwillingly sworn only added to his restlessness and uneasiness the baronial opposition was already broken up hereford died in twelve ninety eight and norfolk had completely abased himself by a temporary surrender of his estates to the crown and by receiving them back fettered with the obligations of a conditional estate that came under the provisions of the statute quia emptores edward was thus in a position to carry out a policy which he had devised to prevent a renewal of the baronial opposition his greatest danger was from the higher aristocracy represented by the great earls the earldom of the days of edward stood in a very different position to the somewhat commonplace dignity which goes by the same name in the nineteenth century the earldom was still the highest rank of the peerage it still retained some traces of its earlier position as the official head of a county it involved a great position both in the court and in the nation the number of earls was so scanty that each individual earl was personally and territorially important in the earls the people saw their natural leaders edward's plan seems to have been to prevent a renewal of the baronial opposition and to add to the strength of the crown by getting as many of the great fiefs as he could under his direct control circumstances favored his design and a series of lucky escheats and well-designed marriages much facilitated the process in thirteen hundred the death of edward's cousin edmund of almain threw the rich earldom of cornwall into the king's hands on the death of the earl of norfolk in thirteen o six his earldom also escheated to the crown for lack of heirs to his body contemporary writers put edward's lucky acquisition of these two great earldoms side by side with his conquests of wales and scotland the young earl humphrey of hereford married in thirteen o two the king's daughter elizabeth the welshwoman the widowed countess of holland meanwhile former efforts in the same direction were bearing fruit joan of acre administered the gloucester inheritance of edward's youthful grandson the young thomas of lancaster darby and leicester was expecting the succession of lincoln and salisbury edward of carnarvon now ruled over wales and the earldom of chester edward and his near kin thus enjoyed a remarkable concentration of the great earldoms in their hands the policy had a temporary success and perhaps accounts in part for the cessation of the baronial opposition in the last years of edward's reign but the policy had its dangerous side and its permanent results were by no means favourable either to the dignity of the crown or to the prosperity of the nation the chroniclers attributed the decadence that set in after edward's death to the dying out of so many of the old earldoms still edward's policy was at least a thoroughly english policy and if it failed it failed largely because by identifying the younger branches of the royal house with the ancient feudal dynasties it also identified them with the hereditary jealousies and factions of the old lines of earls it had the merit of making impossible a royal caste cut off by rigid laws of etiquette and pride of birth from the general mass of the nobility it was both the strength and the weakness of edward that while he was politically but the greatest official in the kingdom he was socially but the head of the english aristocracy though he firmly believed that his power was of god he never aspired to be the semi-divine ruler set by his birth and position upon a pedestal that kept him solitary and apart from the life of the country over which he ruled the baronial opposition being thus got rid of the clerical opposition alone remained to be dealt with winchelsea was still unreconciled but winchelsea held a great position and could not easily be attacked since the falkirk campaign bishop back of durham had to edward's intense disgust 
thrown up his diplomatic and military positions and after a vain attempt at mediation allied himself to winchelsea but beck got mixed up in obscure struggles with his chapter and on his setting out for rome in thirteen o two without the king's permission edward took into his own hands the rich temporalities of his see on his return beck submitted himself to edward who restored him his lands but fresh difficulties soon drove beck back to the papal court where he obtained in thirteen o five the resounding title of a patriarch of jerusalem edward complained that he had obtained from the pope grants injurious to the rights of the crown took away from him some of his best manners and never left him in peace for the rest of his life when edward pursued beck with whom he had no personal quarrel with such unremitting rancor it was plain that he was only waiting his opportunity to inflict an even more signal vengeance on the hated archbishop in thirteen o five the favor of philip the fair secured the papacy for edward's gascon subject bertrand de Gott, archbishop of bordeaux who assumed the name of clement v as evidence of his subservience to the french king clement now transferred the seat of the papacy from italy to france and began that fatal seventy years of babylonish captivity which did so much to lower the holy see both in actual power and popular esteem clement showed almost as much deference to edward as to philip his submissive attitude gave opportunity for edward to work out a great plan of revenge while it encouraged king and nation alike to enter into a course of anti-roman legislation that was england's revenge for pope boniface's slights upon her independence edward still fretted under his obligations to observe the charters as soon as clement had become pope he applied for and obtained a dispensation from his oath to observe the charters in their new and enlarged form the complacent pope at once gave the required absolution and edward issued a new ordinance of the forest in which he repudiated those portions of the revised forest charter which had so long offended his sense of dignity further action he did not take and this must be considered a sign of moderation for clement's bull was so wide in its wording that it would have empowered edward if he had a mind to it to repudiate the whole of the additions to the great charter wrung from him in twelve ninety seven this shows that edward had no design of violating the essential elements of the english constitution but it was at best a great falling away for the old king to revert to the worst precedents of his stormy youth this declension from the doctrine of keep troth may tend to take the king off the lofty pedestal on which his admirers have sometimes placed him but nothing was more natural for a medieval king than to submit his conscience to his interests and in no way did the papacy exercise a more demoralizing influence upon europe than through the facility with which it gave men of easy or formal honesty a means of sheltering their weakness under the protecting aegis of the church the king's vengeance was now turned on the able and accomplished primate whose rigid regard for the interests of his cloth and persistent hostility to the crown were now to be atoned for by a signal fall winchelsea's relations with edward had been further complicated by a fierce and unworthy quarrel with edward's favorite minister bishop walter langton the archbishop had accused langton of simony adultery murder and intercourse with the devil but the minister had been triumphantly acquitted of these foul and monstrous charges and now pursued the primate with a deadly hatred a long accusation was sent up to avignon against winchelsea of which the most serious part was a charge of treason based upon his conduct in the parliament of lincoln in thirteen o one clement again showed the utmost willingness to oblige the king winchelsea was suspended and summoned to appear before the papal court in a last stormy interview the archbishop besought the king for leave to quit his kingdom 
permission to go said edward right willingly we give but permission to return thou shalt never have we know thy craft thy subtlety thy treachery and thy treason the pope will deal with thee as thou deservest favor at our hands thou must never expect merciless hast thou been to others mercy to thyself will we never show edward was as good as his word and for the rest of his reign winchelsea remained in poverty and exile but edward quickly quarrelled with the complacent pope on the question of the administration of the lapsed revenues of the see of canterbury and edward was fully backed up by the rising anti-papal feeling in the nation the spirit which had animated the barons at lincoln culminated in thirteen o seven in the famous statute of carlisle the first act of anti-roman legislation in england nothing but edward's death prevented a regular breach with the pope never did edward's affairs seem more flourishing than in the early part of thirteen o six scotland remained subdued the french were friendly the pope was the king's creature the barons and commons were alike well disposed the arch-enemy winchelsea was in exile though old and stiff edward remained in good health he had recently taken vigorous steps to grapple with the administrative disorder which was almost chronic in the middle ages and nothing had made the old king better liked among peace-loving men than his putting down by his writs of trevastone the groups of armed ruffians who worked all sorts of misdeeds the only drop of bitterness in the cup of his happiness was the unworthy conduct of his son and heir immense pains had been taken to instruct the young edward in martial accomplishments and drill him in the principles and routine of business and statecraft but within the tall strong handsome frame of the young prince was the heart of a coward and trifler he had no serious interests wasted his time in gambling and rioting in low society and cared for nothing but his horses hounds players and boon companions in thirteen o five the young edward had incurred his father's ire by a wanton attack upon bishop langton and was with difficulty restored to favour by the good offices of his stepmother the certainty that there was no guarantee that his policy should be continued after his death must have weighed heavily upon the aged king terrible news now came from scotland robert bruce the grandson of the claimant earl of carrick since thirteen o four by his father's death had for several years been among edward's scottish partisans but he now withdrew himself from the court and took horse for scotland where on tenth february thirteen o six he met john comyn the former regent in the franciscan convent at dumfries the two men were old rivals the representatives of houses long hostile to each other a dispute broke out hot words passed swords were drawn and comyn was slain bruce was now forced to become a fugitive and in self-defence was compelled to identify himself with the party of scottish independence with which in recent years he had been secretly intriguing he found that the spirit of scottish nationality still burnt as fiercely as ever he soon manifested a skill and daring that shows him to have been a born leader of men before lent was out half scotland was again in revolt on twenty fifth march bruce was crowned king of scots at scone a few strong castles with their english garrisons and a few nobles jealous of bruce's progress alone actively upheld the english cause the ill tidings of the scottish revolt were brought to edward at winchester whither he had gone to keep his lenten court he burst into a terrible explosion of wrath and resolved to stamp out all resistance in the stubborn and intractable nation on which all clemency was thrown away troops were at once dispatched to the north and a great gathering of the younger nobles was summoned to westminster to prepare for an expedition of crushing numbers and force the king was now so infirm that he could not ride and was taken from winchester to london in a horse-litter on whit sunday he held a gorgeous pageant at westminster 
he solemnly dubbed his son edward a knight three hundred young men of noble houses gathered together in the abbey church to receive the same honor from their future king there was such a pressure round the high altar of the abbey that two of the new knights were crushed to death by the throng then two swans their necks encircled with chains of gold were brought in edward now vowed by god and the swans that he would at once set out to scotland and avenge the wrongs done to holy church and the realm by the rebellious murders of john comyn when bruce was subdued the king pledged himself that he would no more bear arms against christian men but would go to the holy land and die fighting against the infidel the prince and the other new knights took the same vow and the musters were ordered to assemble early in july at carlisle thither the prince of wales was at once sent edward followed his son as quickly as his infirmities would allow on michaelmas day edward reached the austin priory of lanocost near carlisle here he took up his quarters for more than half a year as the state of his health and his business with the pope combined to make it impossible for him to take the field in person but the heavy hand of his generals was laid upon scotland and the new king robert was soon reduced to such straits that he fled to the western isles for refuge while the stern resolve of the old king to have done with clemency involved the unhappy scots in worse desolation and destruction than ever many scottish nobles were taken prisoners and at once put to death as traitors their lands were confiscated and handed over to english earls in edward's confidence bruce's own domains were overrun carrick was bestowed on henry percy annandale went to the young earl of hereford another son-in-law of the king had the great earldom of athol this time scotland was to be held by chains of iron in the merest and barest slavery yet even in his worst moods edward bade his soldiers spare the common folk whose only crime was obedience to the orders of their natural lords he sternly rebuked the prince of wales for his indulgence in an indiscriminate slaughter that distinguished neither leader from follower nor grown man from woman and child edward suffered much from sickness during his stay at lanercost but he still found energy enough to move in march thirteen o seven to carlisle to meet the parliament which he had summoned to assemble in the border city with the return of summer bad news again came from the seat of war bruce returned from his hiding place and the good will of the mass of the population again allowed him to make headway against the strong armies of edward as soon as parliament was over the old king resolved to take the field in person he offered up in the cathedral church the horse litter which had conveyed him from the south and again mounted his charger and put himself at the head of the army that was pouring into scotland but his great spirit was no longer able to control his failing body for two successive days he struggled on but each day he could only manage to ride two miles and on the third day he was forced to rest altogether on the fourth day edward managed to reach on sands a village less than six miles from carlisle he was now attacked by dysentery and sank rapidly as he lay dying he sent his last words of counsel to his absent son he urged him to persevere in the subjection of scotland and to avoid unworthy favourites his last thoughts turned to the two great enterprises on which he had bent his mind the subjection of scotland and the recovery of the holy land even after his death he longed to share in those great works he begged his son to carry his bones about with him in his scottish campaigns so that even the dead edward might still lead his warriors to victory against the hated enemy he also requested that his heart should be sent to the holy land with a train of a hundred knights to fight for the recovery of the sepulchre of the lord he then prepared himself for death and with a prayer for the divine mercy on his lips quietly passed away on seventh july thirteen o seven at the age of sixty eight 
with the great king died his great work and the tragedy of his end was made more pitiful by the wretched farce of the reign of edward the second his dying wishes were set at naught the scots campaign was given up his body was sent with scanty reverence to an immediate burial place at westminster where it now reposes under a plain monument of grey marble but little corresponding to his greatness as a king and upon which has been inscribed edwardus primo scotorum malius hic est patem serva but it was not only by reason of his son's unworthiness that edward's most cherished plans were doomed to failure he had attempted more than even his strong purpose could have successfully accomplished but if an independent scotland bore witness that edward's great ambition was a failure his work lived on in his own realm of england where after ages agreed to recognize in him one of the greatest and wisest of her rulers and where the whole subsequent history of the land he loved so well bore daily witness to the strength and endurance of the great king's work end of part three end of king edward the first of england three essays by thomas frederick tout